Good morning, North Livingston. It's good to see everybody in the house of the Lord this morning. If you would, let's stand as we open our service with a time of prayer. We still have several on the prayer list. It'll be on the, the board there in just a moment. Uh, continue to remember uh, the many that have sent word and asked us to remember them. Uh, we've been asked this morning to add to that list. Uh, Daryl, help me with the name. Greg Heidel, is that correct? Which is uh, a nephew to Daryl's brother-in-law. I uh, understand he's been transferred to Chicago. Uh, pretty critical. Just remember uh, Greg and re remember the, the Heidels and uh, Daryl's uh, sister and that family as, as they're trying to get to the hospital. Also, uh, we've had uh, Daryl's cousin on the list for some time, Tom Kaufman. Tom passed away this week. So remember Daryl's family, uh, continue to lift them up with, with and the Kaufman family. Uh, are there updates to the list? Remember? Remember my brother Lonnie Nall. He's in the hospital. He has Parkinson's real bad. And his colon's kind of wanting to shut down. So okay, all right. Also, I was talking with Caitlin this morning. Uh, baby Trip may be here anytime. Uh, so just pray for them and all of all of that. I, I don't think the due date's actually here, but uh, the doctor said that uh, he may be ready to come out of the oven anytime. So just be remembering Caitlin and, and all of the family there. Are there anyone else, any other updates? All right, let's go to the Lord at a time of prayer. Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day. Father, I know I say it often, and, and it just still, Father, just uh, the awesomeness of your giving us the first day of the week is the Lord's day. Father, we come off of the Sabbath rest, and, and, and Father, then we begin our week, uh, always an opportunity for a fresh start. And uh, Father, we are reminded of the Lord's day being the day of the resurrection. God, just so much in your plan that you just coordinated. And God, as we come together as, as the family, as a fellowship, as the church, uh, just, uh, just the awesomeness of beginning the week together. And, and Father, we've been made so much aware in the last couple of years of, of even the, the privilege of getting to assemble. And so we just want to thank you for, for being able to be here today. God, we thank you for all of those that for whatever reason, can't be with us, some because of distance, some because of, of, of age or sickness. And, and Father, they're able to watch by way of internet. That is a blessing. We thank you for that today. And, and God, we just, uh, we, we, we're just reminded of your goodness to us. Father, we look at a list with so many names and so many needs. And Father, even in our presence today, there are those that have sickness. There's those that are just depending on you because we, we trust you as the great physician. God, there's those that are depending on you today because of the promise that when we're bereaved, that you grant to us a peace that passes all understanding. God, we're reminded of, of how you uh, invited us uh, to come to you in prayer. And, and Father, this privilege of prayer that Jesus said that it was necessary that he go away. He's preparing a place for us, but he also instructed us that he's seated at your right hand today in that throne room. And, and the whole purpose of that is to make intercession on our behalf, to, to hear our prayers, to plead our case. Not that you need reminding, but, but God, his very presence reminds you and so, God, that helps us, that encourages us. And so, God, we come on behalf of these many that are, are needing healing, these many that have reached out and asked us to remember them, those that have relationship issues, those that have uh, job changes and, and, and beginnings and, and, and things in their jobs that, uh, Father, there's some that there's just changes coming and they're apprehensive about that. And, God, they're asking you. Uh, God, just to direct and to work. And, and, and Father, there's some that have decisions to make. And, and Father, again, we just, we join all of our prayers together and come to you. Father, we, we pray for the Holy Spirit's anointing in this place today. God, we, we pray that you'd be with Joe and the team as they lead us in just a few moments in a time of worship. God, as we lift our voices to you in song. And then, Father, we pray in the time of the message today, God, that you would just, again, the anointing of the Holy Spirit would just help us as we, as we briefly look at Scripture and, and, and contemplate and, and, God, just let that just change us, transform us. In fact, the whole Scripture today is about us being transformed 
to be changed, to be more in your image. And God, we ask for the Holy Spirit's anointing and help as we look into that today. God, we love you. We thank you. We commit this service into your hands. And we ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus, because of his shed blood, because of his completed work on Calvary and because of our awaiting his second coming, which we believe is real soon. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Just want to remind you of our uh, Sunday school hour at 10 o'clock. Discipleship is at nine o'clock. Uh, always an exciting time. We want you to be a part of that. Wednesday nights, we're back on Wednesdays with the young people, uh, the team kid. If you know of a young person, 615, uh, I think some flyers may still be back there. Pick that up. We encourage you to tell them. And then the adults uh, are meeting at seven o'clock on Wednesday night. So I encourage you to be a part of that. Also, uh, you'll find in the back, and you see some backpacks are already coming in. Uh, the backpacks for uh, children in, in Appalachia, in Eastern Kentucky, uh, all of the information is back there. If you want to pick up a backpack or two, or maybe purchase your own backpack, uh, this is uh, broken down by ages, and it tells you exactly what to put in those backpacks. I would remind you, when you pick up the list, there's two items, copy of the Christmas story and the Bible, a copy of the Bible. The church is providing both of those things, but then it gives you things to put in, things that we ask that you not put in. Uh, make sure you get those, uh, get those filled up, do one, two, or 10, and bring those back. Uh, we need those back by the end of September uh, so we can get those to the association and the, those will be uh, at the annual meeting. We'll try to get those on over to uh, uh, Bowling Green and then they'll go to the children and again, as we've said, uh, we've done this for a few years now to the, the children in eastern Kentucky, but especially this year uh, after the flooding, it's going to be all the more important. Uh, so you be praying about that and then get involved in that and, and help in that way. Anything else that maybe I haven't announced? No? Are you coming this morning? Children? No children? Yes. Will you come right on and then Joe, you right after Joan. to see each and every one of you out this morning. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries today? See none? Or at least nobody's admitting to it. Leaning on the everlasting arms. It's good to see each and every one of you. Sing out and make some noise for the Lord this morning. Thank you. 
He is Lord. you take us to the Lord at this time, brother? Dear Father, Lord, we want to come to this morning. We want to thank you for this day and this opportunity we have to come out and tell you that you give us a regular come out to your house to be. Thank you for this house we have to come to. Thank you for all the many blessings and talk about the Sunday school this morning. Dear Lord, we have to build for the Lord and give us a gift. We just thank you so much for much of that promise. And we will see you in the service to you, Lord, and we will see you. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bob. He is Lord. Every knee will bow. And where every tongue will confess 
one day that he is Lord. Be into your name. before you, Lord, in your presence today. Giving you thanks, Lord, for this day that you've made and you've given to us. Lord, I thank you for each and every one, Lord, that's here today. I thank you for the ones, Lord, that are home and watching by internet. Pray, God, that you would just bless each and everything that's done and said here today. I pray for Brother Danny, Lord, as he comes before us, Lord, and breaks the bread of life to us. God, may it speak to our hearts. May it change us forevermore, Lord. Lord, as the song says, we are a vapor. And we are a vapor, Lord. 
we do wither away so quickly. Your word tells us that. God, may we prepare our hearts. May we prepare ourselves in that day, Lord, that we meet you. Thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, if there's someone here that, or by internet, Lord, that's never said yes to you, that's never said yes, Jesus, save me. Pray, Lord, that today would be that day. And Father, help us, Lord, as we go out into the highways and byways, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be able to just open our mouth and profess your name. Help us, Lord, not to hold back. Because, Lord, we know that any fear that comes upon us, Lord, that that fear not come from you. Help us to be the people, Lord, that you've called us to be. And the God and direct rest this service in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. We began a study a couple of weeks ago on Wednesday night and have actually been kind of introducing the study for the past three weeks. Began in earnest this past Wednesday night and I wanted to kind of do a, a little overview uh, of that study this morning for the whole church. Uh, kind of why we're beginning that study, why we're doing that study, the importance of that study, <clears throat> and the importance for us as a church as Christians. Uh, and Paul addresses uh, this without using the terminology that I'm going to use this morning. Romans chapter number 12, and then as we look at to much of Paul's life, uh, Paul was dealing, dealing with this issue of what I want to call today a biblical worldview. Uh, we all have worldviews. We all have uh, uh, basic presuppositions and philosophies that make up uh, who we are, what we think, why we do what we do, the decisions that we make. But uh, if you stand as you turn to Romans chapter number 12, Paul, uh, as I said, gives us this, um, um, without using the term worldview, uh, the idea behind. Uh, and, and in Romans, he's talking to the Christians in the region Romans chapter number 12, and beginning at verse number 1, and he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, holy and, and pleasing to God. One version says, this is your reasonable service. Another translation puts it, this is true worship. When we come before God, Paul says, we're to bring our, our whole being as a sacrifice before God. Now, remember the, the congregation that he was writing this to, that he was addressing, that he was dealing with, they understood all of what sacrificial systems was. When you made a sacrifice... You brought that in, you laid it on the altar, and it was totally given. It was totally consumed. You didn't just leave part, take part. When you sacrificed something, it was all in, all, nothing held back. And so Paul says, you present yourselves, present your bodies because of the mercies of God, what God has done. And then in verse number two, when we present ourselves to God with this totality, when when I'm a born-again Christian, when I acknowledge what Christ has done for me, the gift God has given me, he saved me from hell. He's forgiven my sins, the, the only sacrifice that could do that. And so Paul says, when you present yourself to God with that idea, that knowledge, that understanding, then Paul says, do not be conformed to this age. Don't. Don't be swallowed up in this world. Don't just go along to get along. Do not be conformed to this age, but be ye transformed. I'm reminded of the toys my grandson has it's called the Transformers. They just totally change into something else. Don't be conformed to this age, be ye transformed. How do you do that, Paul says? 
by the renewing of your mind. Have you ever renewed something? You've taken something old and you've made it fresh and new. You've renewed something. Do that with your minds. Why? Paul says, so that you may discern what is that good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Let us pray. God, I ask that you help us for these next few moments as we look at this idea of a worldview, a philosophy. What is it that makes us who we are? What drives us? What is it that determines our, our actions and how we conduct business and how we vote or if we vote? What determines our ideas on the major issues of our culture today and what separates us as Christians from the non-Christian in our views and our ideas on the major topics of the day. May we apply this scripture, may we take these thoughts, and may we as Christians, and if there's one under the sound of my voice that doesn't know you in the full free pardon of sin, doesn't know you as savior, doesn't know you as a Christ follower, First of all, I ask that the Holy Spirit convict and draw them to be saved today. And then God, for all that profess to be a Christian today, may we ask ourselves, so what is my philosophy? What is my worldview? Have I presented myself wholly? Have I given myself, have I, have I presented myself for the renewing of my mind to be transformed, to be Christ-like in all that I do? And may we answer that question as we go through the furtherance of this service. In the name of Jesus, I ask, and all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. As I said, a worldview, we all have them, whether we know it or not. You have opinions. You have ideas, you have likes and dislikes. There's things that drive what you do that determine your decisions. We call that a worldview. And here a few years ago, that term came about, do we have a biblical worldview? Some of our, our leaders in Christianity, some of our theological leaders and some of our institutions began to ask us to consider, so what? What is it? Is it a secular worldview? Does the world, does, does, does the teachings of the world, the ideas of the world, the philosophies of the world, does that determine who we are, what we do? Or as Christians, when the Bible says we're to be peculiar, we're to be called out, we're to be different, does this book, does the followings of Jesus Christ give us what we call this biblical worldview. You look around society today, you look at our, our culture today and, and, and what we're doing on Wednesday nights is a study on some, some major cultural issues of the day. We're, we're, we're taking up nine of those major issues and, and the, the place we're beginning on that is the fact, the, the, the writer of, of the book that we're following on this, he, he takes up the fact when you ask yourself if you are, if you're going along with the world or if maybe you, you're, you're offending, and man, we hear that word all the time today, I'm offending somebody. Somebody's always offended at something or somebody. And the point he makes is the, the, the Bible, the teachings of the Bible are offensive anyway. When Jesus said, I'm the only way, there's a lot of people in our culture today that just take issue with that. And I dare say, there are, you'll see here in just a moment, there's a lot of people in the Protestant churches today that take issue with the fact that Jesus said, I am the way. You can only get to the Father by me. And so as we look at all the cultural issues today, and if we have a biblical worldview, we have to understand that many times we're going to be in opposition to the world. Jesus was in opposition to the world. They didn't all just have a love fest with Jesus Christ. Do you remember what happened to him? Do you remember what the, the religious leaders of the day wanted to do to him? Do you remember when he said that I and my father are one that they said he blasphemes? Do you remember when, 
when one of the government officials said, I'm going to give you a real easy choice to get you off of the hook. You can have this Jesus Christ guy, all love and peace, or you can have this murderer, Barabbas. Do you remember what the people did? Crucify him. They didn't all love him. As a matter of fact, Jesus told those disciples, boys, you got to remember when they hate you, they hated me first. Not much fun for a preacher to preach, is it? Not much fun to sit and listen to, is it? But you see, as Christians, we have to identify where we stand on the issues. What, what compels us? What drives us? Do we have a biblical worldview? And as we look around our society, we see that there's, there's tensions, there's fights, there's arguments all around us. And what we see playing out in our culture is just a result, a, a natural result of what happens when differing worldviews collide. I mean, we're seeing it play out. I, I don't remember as a child, I, I can remember as a child when my dad would say at six o'clock at night when the news would come on, y'all sit down and shut up. The news is on. So in my, my house, we watched the news. It was a thing we did every night. And I don't remember it all being as divisive as it is today. I don't remember it being as, as political as it is today. That's all it is anymore. One side against the other. And man, nobody likes anybody. Nobody wants to go in the back room, smoke a cigar and work things out. They just want to kill each other. What causes that? You see, what we're seeing is world views are colliding. And so what we're taking up on Wednesday nights, we're looking at nine issues of a, of a cultural war, if you will, going on in our society today. We're looking at poverty. How do we deal with poverty? What is the, what's the government's answer to poverty? What's the Bible's answer to poverty? What, what is the, the biblical worldview between the haves and the have-nots? And we as Christians, what drives our opinions on the issues of poverty? That seems like a pretty easy one. We may find it's not as easy as we think it is. What, what about same-sex marriage? I, I can remember a time when same-sex marriage was very rare indeed. I don't know of a family today that it doesn't affect the family somewhere. It's in my family. I have nieces that she has married her. And they're very vocal on their rights. What do we do with this so-called same-sex marriage? And does the government even have a right in marriage at all? Does the Bible address marriage? Does the Bible address relationships between men and women, men and men, women and women? And by the way, it does. And so, as a Christian, what is my worldview on that? That affects policy. That affects decisions. What about racism? You cannot watch a 30-minute news segment today without racism coming in. And man, is it coming in. Uh, uh, we were watching the, the news the other night, and, and we were watching about a school district. And they had a policy uh, last in, first out. If you were the last one hired and something happened that they needed to, to downsize, you were the first one out. Well, that's been modified now. It's not last in, first out now. It's if you're working for this particular school system and you're white, you're the first one out the door. People of color, racism. What, what, how do we define racism? And our, our country has an abysmal history on racist policies. And I mean, you go back to what we did in this country a couple of hundred years ago. We, we missed that bad. 
What does the Bible say? Where does our worldview come? These are things we're looking at. Sex slavery. You don't even think of that as being an issue in Hampton, Kentucky. And yet it's all around us with these missing children and what happens to them. And at the upper levels of our government and, and culture today, we hear of, of abuses in this thing of sex slavery. Our grandchildren were, uh, the oldest one is driving now and we were at a gathering with the family last night in a larger town and some of the grandchildren were going out with the older grandchild to go shopping. First solo trip out by themselves and the idea, you know, you do not get away from one another because somebody will grab you. It's an issue. Immigration. Again, you do not watch a 30-minute news segment today, local or otherwise, but watch you don't hear about the border. Immigration, legal immigration, illegal immigration. I was hauling some hay the other night and I, I was a minority. The conversations were all German and Spanish. I didn't understand a word. One group, they're natural citizens. The other, I don't know, but... It's, it's all around us. What, what do we do? Where do we, where do we draw our, our ideas on immigration? Abortion. Abortion. You would, I would think this would just be, I, I wouldn't even think it would have to be an issue among Christian people. And yet in my own family, it, within the last week, I, I watched a, a niece dedicating a newborn baby in church. And then the very next conversation from her was how they have every right to abort babies and you better not say anything different and we're going <laughs> to vote you down if you do. Militant on the rights for abortion. It, 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 it's issues. Uh, orphans. What, I mean, the Kentucky Baptist Convention has a great, great uh, stance and history on, on, on orphans and adoptions and foster care. But what does the Bible say about it? Where, how do we develop our, our viewpoints? Pornography, this is one of the things we're going to look at. They tell me that, that some 75% of the men in our country today have an addiction to pornography. That is an astounding number. But the people that know, that that's what they say the, the figures are. What does the Bible say about it? What does culture say about it? What does this, I have rights in our world say about it? So as we look at our, our world views, what do we do? Do we compromise? Do we become tolerant? I mean, we heard that for a long time. You gotta tolerate, be tolerant, accept. Do, do we engage the culture? Are we just to be real nice, polite Christians and just shut up and be silent? What do we do? What does a biblical worldview tell us to do? What happens to a society or a culture when convic conflicting worldviews fight for power and influence? So we're looking at this on Wednesday night, but for us today as a broad overview, as a church, as your pastor, I want to look at this idea of, of a biblical worldview. Is it ancient? Is it irrelevant? Is it something that was just for Peter, Paul, James and 2,000 years ago? Or does it have implications for us today? You see, we have the spirit of the Lord that lives in us. And when we become a born-again Christian, we have a commission that Christ gave to the church. We're to go into all of the world. That means we're to be influencers. And so how do we do that? What, what do we do as we have that empowerment of the Holy Spirit living in us? And what is this idea of a biblical worldview? And again, do we just stand back and be silent? Do we engage it? How do we handle it? Chuck Colson, many of you may remember Chuck Colson. He was a 
and a, an attorney, a political advisor back in the days of Nixon. In fact, he was, he was what they called in the, the Watergate thing, he was what they called the, the Watergate hatchet man. And he was so involved in the Watergate break-in and the issues and, and advising the president for that period of time that he even was sentenced to federal prison for his role in Watergate. And yet Chuck Colson during that time of his life became a born again Christian. He had a real experience with Christ. And he took all of his experiences and all that he had been through and he, he, he became an author, he became a noted speaker. And, and he, he wrote a book called How Shall We Live? And he was one of the first that dealt with this issue. He was at the upper echelons of our government. He was, he was in the nitty gritty of, of all of this. And so he talks about this biblical worldview. And this is what he says, how, how do we redeem a culture? He says, the answer is simple. We redeem it from the inside out, from the individual to the family to the community and then outward in ever widening ripples. We must begin by understanding what it means to live by biblical Christian worldview principles in our own behavior and choices. And unless we do, we will interpret the biblical commands according to the spirit of the age and we will therefore be conformed to the world rather than to God's word. Romans chapter 12. He was a man of this century, this culture, saying the same thing Paul said 2,000 years ago. You have to redeem yourself through Christ. And then you have to transform yourself or if you don't, you will be conformed to the ways of the world. He went ahead to say, polls consistently show that Americans worry most about social and moral decay, crime, family breakdown, drug abuse, sex, violence, entertainment, violence in the entertainment media, all results of moral choices made ultimately by individuals. I looked, he wrote this book back in the 1990s. And I thought, man, it is as applicable today as it was when he wrote it, if not more so. Of course, he's already died and gone on to, to be with Jesus. But he goes ahead to say, given these facts, one might expect the nation's bully pulpits, that's this right here, would be devoted to encouraging people to take responsibility for their lives to exert the self-discipline needed to change behavior. Instead, for the past few decades, go back to the 70s and the 80s, that's when he wrote this, and it's up to the current time. The dominant non-biblical cultural voices have argued that individuals have a right to live in any way they choose and society has a responsibility to pick up the tab for any negative consequences that result. He could have written this yesterday. This attitude is not confined to the government. It's amazing how many ordinary Americans have fallen into the trap of expecting someone else to pick up the cost of their own irresponsibility. Where did this idea of value-free lifestyles come from? What are its worldview roots? How do the categories of creation, the fall of man, and the redemption of man help us to diagnose what's wrong with the predominant secular view and see how a biblical Christian worldview can lead to a better, healthier, and more rational way of living. And we as the church, we as Christians, we're admonished by Paul and men like this to renew our minds. Do things differently. We do this by being willing to use, as I said a while ago, when we're born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. And then our prayer life, praying differently. I tell you all the time, the Bible tells us to pray for our leaders, pray for those that are in authority. And man, it's hard not to pray that they don't break a leg when they fall off their bicycle. But that's not what the Bible teaches me to do. The Bible says to pray differently to pray for those leaders. Why? Pray because they are an eternity bound soul and some of them closer to being to eternity than they realize. And then he says we're to pray for them 
that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. Church, there's a reason the Bible tells us to do this. We're to study the word of God. This is our guide. This is basic instructions before leaving earth, B-I-B-L-E. This is our guide. I hope we're all in it every day. I hope we're all using it as our manual because that's what it is. And God help us if all we get is that little snippet we get on Sunday morning. And you trust me to tell you honestly what's, I could tell you anything and you may not know. You gotta study it out, seek it out for work. Work out your own salvation with fear and trust. What does that mean? Hiding God's word in your heart. Why? David said, David said, before we had all of this, when all he had was pieces of the Old Testament, hide God's word in your heart that you might not sin against God. Why? 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 Why have a biblical world? Why does it even matter? So that we can impact a fallen culture. So that we can be influencers for the kingdom of God. So that we can see lives changed. And folks, look around you. What we've been doing isn't working. I look at all of us. I'm, I'll just tell you from here like I'd tell you if I was standing in your living room. We raise our kids. We raise our kids in church. Our kids go off to college and they don't come back to church. And it's not just our church. It's every church. And the church has done so much but where is the church going to be in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? We are getting old, people. We're going to die. And then who's going to be there to pick up and do what the church does? The government? I got to tell you, I haven't agreed with much they've done this week, this month, this year. Romans 12, 2. How do we... What, it's such a massive task. What do we do? Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is that good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. A biblical worldview. We need to understand that worldviews matter in a society. They matter to the entire scope of a society. Worldviews. Now, you're thinking of biblical world, but I'm thinking any worldview, any worldview, wherever it comes from, secular worldviews, academia worldviews, they impact culture. They determine culture. They determine right or wrong. They determine policy. They determine belief systems. They determine family systems. They determine political systems. That's why I stand here and, and, and this is not the most exciting thing I can preach on. But I think it's something we've got to hear. It's something we've got to be aware of. It's going to determine the future of our society. Opposing worldviews will always collide. They will always bring turmoil and arguments and war and fights and tensions and political dissension and disunity. But what do I do about my worldview? There's five areas that determine your worldview. They seem rather simplistic. But there's five things that the experts tell us determines our worldview. Number one, God. That just almost seems like a given until you start 
talking to people in our community. And then you get all kinds of ideas that there may not even be a God. Is there a personal, transcendent, supreme being to whom we are all accountable? If so, what is this God like? And if not, then what? What's your view on God? Where do you get your view on God? Who, who determines your ideas about God? And remember, when you're looking at a biblical worldview, it should come from Bible. What does the Bible say about God? Did God create the earth a hundred million billion years ago? And yet you watch trusted news sources. They say they're trusted. That's how they advertise. Watching one last night. We was in the other room and the guy starts talking about, I don't know, some kind of a footprint he saw and said that was last seen a hundred million years ago and it's not going to be seen again for another hundred million years. And I'm like, oh man, where's he going with that? A biblical worldview, a literal biblical worldview would teach creation, would teach that this is a 6,000 year old planet. And I realize that people say, oh, you're dumb and you're stupid for believing that. Well, you believe you're 100 million years old. I'm going to believe my 6,000 year old. And when we get there, we're going to find out. God, what's your view on God? Creation. Where did the world come from? What sustains all of this? Is there a spiritual part of reality or is it just all material? You answer these questions, your, your viewpoints, and then we're going to score it here in just a minute. Not really, but in your mind, I want you to be thinking about how you answer these questions. And then do you have a biblical worldview? Humanity, people, who are we? What gives us any unique value? What determines the value of humans? Now think about what the biblical stance is. Humans were important enough that God sent his only begotten son to this world to die for them. And yet sometimes we just want to throw them away on the trash heaps of ideology. The moral order. Who makes the rules? Do some rules apply to everyone and some to a select few? Moral order. And number five, purpose. Why do we exist? And who determines why we exist? Do you have a biblical world view? You see, a biblical world view is a comprehensive understanding of the world. And it's formulated by the, this is the definition. It's formulated by the authority of the Bible. And in parentheses, that says the word of God talking about the 66 books of this Bible. A biblical worldview is a comprehensive understanding of the world that is formulated by the authority of the Bible, the Word of God, and the person of Jesus Christ, again in parentheses, the Word of God. Jesus Christ and the Bible are one and the same. The Word of God made flesh and dwelt among us. A biblical worldview. Ken Ham, you've heard of Ken Ham. We, talked to at length the last several weeks studying Ken Ham, some of his teachings and discipleship. Ken Ham, the founder of the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter here in Kentucky. Ken Ham, when he talks about the, the world view, the biblical world view, he states emphatically that there are two main world views in conflict in our society today. Two. Where do you stand? Which one are you, where, where do you fall? He says the battle is between God's word and man's word. He believes that you either believe the whole word of God or you buy into one of man's fallen worldviews. And then he says those worldviews are influenced by Satan himself. Well, that's one man. That's one guy selling his museum and his ark encounter. 
The Family Foundation talks about a biblical worldview too. Maybe they've talked about it longer than Ken Ham has, Chuck Swindoll. And the Family Foundation says a biblical worldview, this is their definition. A biblical worldview is based on the infallible word of God. You know what that word infallible means? Without error. Without error. Totally from God. A biblical worldview is based on the infallible word of God. And when you believe the Bible is entirely true, then you can follow it, allow it to be the foundation of everything you say and do. So again, the question, do you have a biblical worldview? I would want to think everybody in my congregation would, yes, definitely I do. I understand there's some that would say, well, on some issues, I'm not quite sure I do. I know there are those in my own family that say, well, on some issues, I just don't know that I agree with that. Even though the Bible says it, I just don't know that I agree with it. Here's another test to find out if you have a biblical worldview. George Barna used this as a survey to determine if born again Christians had a biblical worldview. He first did this survey in 1984. I'm going to give you the survey and then I'm gonna give you some very shocking statistics about this survey or maybe not so shocking to you. Maybe it was just shocking to me as a pastor. I don't know, let's see. Here's the survey. George Barna, the way they do this, they call up, they identify born again Christian somehow and they call him on the phone and they say, I want to give you this survey. I want to ask you some questions. You got a few minutes to answer. Yeah, I'll answer your questions. And they begin to ask these questions. They record the answers. When they get through, they just put it out there the way it is. This is the results. They don't skew them in any way. He did this in 1984. The question was sent to born again believers. And the answers to the questions were yes or no. Just yes or no, telephone interview. <clears throat> Here's your first question. Do absolute moral truths exist? Do absolute moral truths exist? God said it, that's it. Well, there, no, no circumstances. Just do absolute moral truths exist? Question number two. Is absolute truth, if absolute moral truths exist, is absolute truth defined by the Bible? Yes or no? Question number three. Did Jesus Christ live a sinless life? Question number four. Is God the all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe and does he still rule it today? Did he make it and does he control it today? Question number five. Is salvation a gift from God that cannot be earned? Yes or no? Question number six. Is Satan real? Next question. Does a Christian have a responsibility to share his or her faith in Christ with other people? Yes or no? Last question. Is the Bible accurate in all of its teachings? Yes or no? Those were the questions. They were asked to born again Christians in 1984 the purpose of the survey was to find out how many born again Christians have a biblical worldview. What percent of born again believers answered yes to all questions? Give me a number. What percent of born again Christians across the United States answered yes to every one of those questions? That guess. How many? 90? Somebody else. What's your idea? How many? 50%, 60, 30. 
Would you be surprised to find out in 1984 in polling born-again believers to see if they had a worldview, 9% answered yes to every question. Do you wonder why our country is where it is? 1984, the year we got married. That was the state of born-again believers. I think it would be appropriate to say, Houston, we have a problem. What happened? Why do so many Christians lack what they describe as a true biblical view, worldview? And how does a, a biblical worldview, I mean, this is, this is the book in my house growing up and my dad wasn't born again until I was 12 years old, but I remember having one of these that sat on the coffee table. You didn't set another book on top of it. That's how it was treated. It wasn't picked up and read every day, but it was there, the family Bible, and you didn't set something else. It, that, that, that's how it was viewed. And yet, by 1984, we had so diluted the worldview Ken Ham, again, and he's studied a lot of this stuff. He said he believes it all began, the dilution of the biblical worldview, when Christians started buying into evolution, Darwinism, and a million-year-old earth theory. What he said was if you take Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 11 and you put a crack in it, You've opened the whole thing up. And we started in this country back in the 30s in our schools teaching evolution, Darwinism, that the Bible wasn't totally correct. There was room in the creation story. There was room in the story of the fall. There was room in the story of Noah and the ark. Might not have been just like the Bible said, and pretty soon those cracks got a wedge in them and they began to move further and further and further apart. To the point by 1984, only 9% of people that identified as born again Christians identified as having a biblical world view. Many people today have dismissed the Bible as irrelevant. They've created their own worldview. They bought into someone else's worldview. As a result, we live in a selfish, fallen world with non-biblical ideas, and they seductively appeal to the desires of our flesh, and we often end up incorporating them into our personal worldview. Here's an example. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3 talks about us being sanctified. And in our sanctification, our setting ourselves apart for God's use, it talks about not falling prey to sexual immorality. Very short little verse. And yet how many people, how many Christians, how many Christians in the church get seduced by lust? We're not even, we're not even going to bring same-sex marriage into it. Premarital sex, fornication, adultery. I'm amazed at people that when I counsel that a man and a woman should not, what the term we use today is cohabitate, my parents call it shacking up. That will get you fired as a pastor. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about when you teach that. I have them in my family. Boyfriend, girlfriend, premarital sex, expecting a baby, and it's the grandest I can remember in my lifetime when that was shunned. When the girls that got pregnant in high school went homebound, 
They weren't allowed to be in the school. Now we build multi-million dollar facilities and hire daycare workers to take care of their children while they go to school. Where are we as Christians in our culture with our worldview? Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world, rather than Christ. Is this new? Is this just, a, just an idea that I've come up with? Is this just something that just happened? Let me take you back to the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, chapter number 26, Paul, the apostle Paul, Paul has a, a conflict with the Roman officials between Festus and King Agrippa. And what you see in that dialogue of Acts chapter 26 is you see a, a ebb and flow, a back and forth, a discourse of colliding world views. It ends up with Paul and his biblical world view getting himself again thrown into prison. It ends up with Paul eventually being murdered, martyred, killed, just like the other disciples. You remember Jesus said, if the world first hated me, it'll hate you. Why? Because you'll maintain a biblical world view. This section of scripture, when you see Paul presenting the gospel, Festus answers him, Paul responds, Agrippa weighs in. And finally, Paul reveals his heart. It's got to be this way. It reveals that all not worldviews are true. We didn't read that in Sunday school or in your home devotion as a worldview, but that's what it is. It's a biblical worldview con con colliding with a, a secular worldview. It was a man sharing his biblical worldview because he was commanded to do it. Opposing worldviews will bring conflict, they'll bring hatred. And this is why Jesus and this is why Jesus' apostles all faced persecution. Again, not an easy message, not one we... But here's something we've got to do. As your pastor, I feel obligated to tell you and what we're going to look at on Wednesday nights is we have to search our hearts. We've got to search our minds. And we've got to make sure that we have a genuine biblical worldview. If you still have your children at home, if you still have your grandchildren under your influence, if you have nieces and nephews, neighbor kids, you better be doing everything you can. We as a church better be doing everything we can I remember hearing, was it Billy Graham that said, we're just one generation away from not being a Christian nation? I'm afraid that time's come and gone. It's time to fill the lifeboats. This thing's going down. And if the trumpet doesn't sound, even if the trumpet does sound, we better be busy renewing our minds, doing the kingdom work. And renewing our minds means having a biblical world view on all of the major issues. But Danny, I don't know what the major issues are. You better be getting to know them because they're going to affect you. They're, they're, they're already affecting you. Whether you like it or not, worldviews affect when you go to the gas pump. Do you know that's part of that? Worldviews affect when you go to the grocery store and you can't find that loaf of bread or that box of crackers. It's important. It's Bible. It was important in Paul's day. 
God thought it important enough that he said, put it in the writ of the Bible because you're going to need it again. It starts with us being connected to God and the Holy Spirit in an intimate and life-changing way. We have to be committed to the biblical worldview and continue to develop it as we search and study God's word. God, what is your will? God, what is your purpose? God, what would you have me do? And then we share that biblical worldview as we share the kingdom to the people in our circle of influence. But here's, here's a little caveat, and I'm guilty of this sometimes. Make sure you share it in a Christ-like way. I have a problem with that sometimes. I told somebody this week, I'm very opinionated, and sometimes I want to tell you my opinion. And I have to remember, you got to do it in a Christ-like way. Jesus was Christ-like in that he was meek, but he was strong. He had a backbone. Think about it. He went to that cross. He laid himself down on that cross. And you don't read about a crying, sniveling sissy. You read about a man giving his life on that cross. We can be Christ-like and still stand up for Christ. May we get busy. Joe, come lead us in a hymn of invitation. As you stand, some singing, some praying, whatever the Holy Spirit's asking you to do, but all of us being obedient to that still small voice of the Holy Spirit, is he asking you to commit to more Bible study, to renewing a relationship with him? Is he asking you to, to repent and rededicate? Is he asking you to whatever? That still small voice. Be obedient to that this morning. Joe, lead us in a be my daily cry while you're calling on others don't pass me by if you've got something for me a word for me something I need to be doing let me be in your will thank you for your attention thank you for your attendance appreciate all of your presence and being here pray for one another lift one another up Pray for the leaders of our country. Pray for the leaders of our community. Pray for our school leaders. School's already back in Livingston, Crittenden starting this week. Pray for our local leaders. A lot of times we don't think about local leaders, but in, in Marion, Crittenden County, we, they need guidance. They need some help. So pray that God will give them some guidance on that water issue. There's a lot of people suffering because of that. You just put yourself in their place. If you were to go home and not be able to turn the spigot on, um, we, we take a lot of things for granted in our country, a lot of conveniences for granted. So let's pray for all of those that are affected by that. Pray for each other. Pray for Wednesday night. Pray for our young people. Pray for more young people. Pray that uh, God will just, um, our, our last days will be better than our former days, that God will bless and, and work there. In case you didn't hear, by way of announcement, we got a granddaughter on the way. We found out last night it's going to be a little girl. 
Praise the Lord for that. Pray for mama and baby. I do in March, I think, right? Pray for them. And pray for, as we said, Caitlin, a little trip. I'm going to be here anytime. Always good to have babies. I love to hear babies cry in the service. So pray for them. All hearts clear. All right. Eric, would you dismiss us, brother?